Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And my goal this morning is to kind of go back and briefly look at verse 5, and then to look at verse 6 in great detail. And we might kind of hint on verse 7 a little bit. And I know that we're moving very slowly through um, this part of Scripture, but there is so much going on here, and I think it is of necessity to make sure that I cover it in great detail and thoroughly, and not just kind of gloss over some of the stuff that is being revealed to us uh, in His Word. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll begin looking at the passage. Dear Father, We are thankful, um, as I always am thankful, for just giving us a day that that we set aside every week that you call the Lord's Day in which we worship you, in which we come to, to know more about you, to hear from your word, to sing praises about this great redemption that you provided us in your son Jesus. And I just ask you now that you be gracious to us in allowing us to understand your word well. That we would then be able to know you better. That we might be able to understand our fight against sin better. And Father, I pray that, that we might uh, just be a sanctified people. That we might be holy and blameless before you. And Father, I ask now that you be gracious and just allow me to convey this truth in that way, that it's clear, that it's concise, and Father, I pray that I would not get out, get in the way or uh, mess up this passage, but that you would just give us a clear understanding of it, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I have grown accustomed to doing through this section, I'm going to read from verse 1 all the way through verse 14, where the Apostle Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus." Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Well, here in chapter 6, we have been focusing on the reality for of all of those who have entered into this union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is this, it is the fact that they have died to sin. And that there are no exceptions. There are no irregularities with this. There's no deviations. There's no special cases for just a, a few people. If you are justified and you have been the person who's been delivered from the penal requirements of the law, 
that means that you have entered into this union with the Lord Jesus. And if you've entered into this union with the Lord Jesus, that means that you have been baptized into his death. And if that is the case, that means that you have died to sin. Consider Paul's question in verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? I'll translate that. Don't you realize that every person who enters into a union with the Lord Jesus, he has died to sin? And I think you have to admit this morning that there is something about this topic that many of us find a bit unsettling. I get the impression that that a lot of us, even when we accept this truth, we accept it with a sense of maybe of angst. There's this apprehension to embrace what Paul is saying. And I do understand this completely. For there is this sense that I struggle myself to fully get my mind around how Scripture conveys this tension that we're going to talk about, which I believe even impedes my ability to communicate or to articulate this the way that I want to. But I don't think it's just me. I notice that as I would read commentary after commentary after commentary over big sections of chapter 6 and into, into chapter 7, that there's, I pick up on this exact same uneasiness from the commentators of how to exactly explain what creates this unsettledness when we hear the idea that we have died to sin. And, and I ask the question, why is this? Why do we respond this way? Why, why are we unsettled when we hear that we have died to sin? I think it is this, when we are honest with ourselves, deep down, we know that our experiences with our walk doesn't match up directly with what Paul is saying here regarding those who have been justified. And when I say that, I'm talking about directly that idea about dying to sin. Because Paul is telling us that through this union, we have died to sin. And yet many of you are saying, oh wow, this isn't good. You ought to just hang out with me on an ordinary Tuesday. You might say, I don't feel dead to sin. My days are full of this constant battle and struggle with sin. Some days I'm even weary of the thoughts of all the temptations and this battle that rages on. And I come here on Sunday mornings to be encouraged in this, and now you tell me that I have died to sin and nothing feels farther from the truth. And I understand this reality. But here is what you must understand. Our salvation, thankfully, is not founded on how we feel at any one moment or what we necessarily experience. It is founded in what God has said and what God has done for us. Amen to that, right? Our salvation is based upon the grace of our God. The free gift through one man, Jesus Christ, that abounds to the many. But listen, I believe what Paul understands here, we understand as well. I believe he knows that we have this response. He understands the weakness of our flesh. He knows that we're prone to be slow to understand and oftentimes We're very slow to believe. And Paul knows the fact that sin still dwells in us. For even here in this letter to the church in Rome, we have a man writing it, who in another letter to the churches in Galatia, 
openly confesses, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. He confesses that he has died to sin. And we look at his life and we can agree that he has died to sin in the way that it's being described. He was Saul of Tarsus. He was somebody who persecuted the church of the living God. He is someone who was an enemy of the church. And yet now, he is somebody who is completely different. He is somebody who's been changed. He's been redeemed. But yet, we also know that this is the same man who says that he experiences... Sin in his life, as we do. As he, goes, as he will go on to say in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. And in that he says there's this sin that still dwells within him. And so then we know that sin still dwells within the regenerate man. So then I, I am trying to flush this out like a thousand times in my mind, and I ask the question in light of this, in light of the whole scope of this, and I think these are questions that you have as well. What does it really mean in practice or in our life for us to die to sin? And I believe this is where Paul is going, on, going to as we get into verses 6 and 7. He sees the elephant in the room. Or we could say the fact that sin still dwells in those who have died to sin. And so he begins to answer the question here, I believe, just how we have died to sin. And again, this is basically what we're going to try and unpack and understand as we move through chapter 6 and into chapter 7, and really even into chapter 8. But I'm, gonna go, I'm trying to get a good start on this this morning, and what I want to do is kind of lay the, the groundwork for all of this moving forward, and again, help us understand and help you understand maybe some of the unsettledness that you have when you hear that you've died to sin because Paul is not saying that here particularly right in this context here so that you might be unsettled by the statement it's actually to encourage you on the reality of what has happened to you he will go to later on to exhort you and make you feel bad later okay <laughs> that's not what he's doing here in these first 10 verses of chapter 6 he's stating facts this is the reality. This is what's going on. This is what has happened. But before we get into the details of our text, let me briefly outline some verses here. Because I believe verse 5 is kind of one of these pivot verses. Because what it does is it, it kind of wraps up and, and, and summarizes all that Paul said in verses 3 and 4. That serves as a summary statement for that. But I also believe that it serves as an outline and a springboard for what he's going to say in verses 6 through 10. So just look there at verse 5. Look at that first part there. He says, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. So that first part there, I believe that what he's going to do is he's going to expound upon that and explain it in verses 6 and 7. And then you have the second part there where he says, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And I think that he expounds upon that in verses 8 through 10. So that kind of serves as somewhat of, a, of an outline of, I believe, where we are going. But here Paul tells us something in verse 5 that is obvious about our union with Christ. For in this union... He describes that what is true of Jesus becomes true of us. And in this union, we are united to Christ at Calvary. But notice the language there. His sharing in his death is not identical. We have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Likeness is the key word here to pay attention to. 
Because obviously, as I have been pointing out here, Paul is not dealing with our actual physical death and our actual physical resurrection from the dead. He is describing our death to sin and our resurrection to spiritual life. So this argument of Paul's is an argument by analogy. Jesus' Jesus's physical death is connected to us dying to sin in this union. And his physical resurrection from the dead is connected to our new spiritual life. Or as Paul puts it in verse 5, newness of life. And Paul's point is that if you are united with him in death, then certainly, without a doubt, you are united with him also in his resurrection. You can't divide the Christ. If one is true, the other has to be true. And what you get is the whole Christ. For this union, and the point of it here that Paul is making, is that this union with Christ makes it impossible for us to continue in sin so that grace may abound. It's impossible. As John Murray states, and regarding this passage, he says, Grace reigns only through the mediation of Christ, and this mediation is operative for us through the union with Him and the efficacy of His death and the virtue of His resurrection. And you might be saying, I have no idea what you just read. I know, people do not talk like that anymore. But let me translate and explain this a little bit. He's saying here, and this is the truth that we've really been talking about, grace is only conferred to the sinner by the Father through Jesus Christ. We understand that, right? There is no other. There is only one mediator between man and God, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. It is Him alone. So, so we understand that grace does not happen outside of Christ. God does not save anyone outside of Christ. He does not save anyone then outside of this union with Christ. So, so everyone who is the object of grace, then by default, when they are saved, they are united to Christ. And if you are united to Christ, he says, then you are by default, you are united to his death and his resurrection. Which means by simple logic and deduction that the objects of grace have died to sin and they have been raised to newness of life. There, it can't be any other way. This is the very reason that you can't go on sinning that grace may abound. You run back to experiences and this is your problem. You have hang-ups. This becomes your problem with understanding this. You may experience this battle with sin in your daily walk. But this is not what he's saying here is happening. What he's saying here is happening is that we have died to sin and this union does not allow us to continue on sinning. But yet we do sin. So what we need to do, what we have to do, is focus on what we know, what we know to be true. And this is what he says here. He goes back in verse 6, and he tells us this. We have, says, knowing this, it is about what we know. God is revealing to us what he has done to us. Again, this isn't about what we feel in any one moment. It's what we know. It's what is true. And he tells us what is true here is that we become united with him in the likeness of his death. That is what he has told us to be true. So no matter what our experience is, no matter what our hang-up is, no matter, no matter what we feel, these things don't matter. And what does Scripture tell us to dwell on? It tells us to dwell on what is true. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, 
whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And here, Paul doesn't appeal to how we feel or point us to dwell on how we feel, but rather, what does he do? What is true? What we know from Scripture. And what do we know from Scripture about the reality of what has happened to us in Christ Jesus? Well, Paul tells us there in verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him. We know that to be true. Now this is where we need to get very specific and precise about what we are saying. So we're going to do some defining here to make sure that we understand this correctly. The first couple words there that I want to point you to is in verse 6 there, the old self. What does this mean? Well, simply put, this is our unregenerate self in its entirety. In context here, it's those who were in Adam. And who we are in Adam is our old man. That man was crucified with Christ. This is the man that you were before your conversion. This is not describing, by the way, some slow change in the sinner to slowly become holy, as some think. We are not in the process right now of being crucified. As they will talk about how long it will take to crucify someone. And then they try to use that here and convey that's how it is with us, that we're, we're trying to crucify the old man throughout our entire life. That's not what he says here. He's conveying the idea here that the old man is what? He's dead. That man you were before conversion, that man has been taken out of the way. That man is no longer. He has died. The language here, he has been crucified and he has been buried. Put a nail in it. Throw six feet of dirt on it. He's done. That's what Paul is clearly communicating here. Now this statement is just further elaboration by Paul on what it means to die to sin. He's, he continues to expound on this idea. But notice the contrast of terms between verse 5 and verse 6. In verse 5, he says, we are resurrected to newness of life. And then in verse 6, he goes back talking about the old self. The new versus the old. Now make sure you understand clearly what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying that this new man and this old man simultaneously exist in the believer. The old man's dead. He's not alive. What has been resurrected to newness of life is something new altogether. So what, what means to be new? For we are described in Scripture as new creatures, new creations. We have a new heart and we have a new mind. We are told that old things have done what? They have passed away. So we can never say that our life is some spiritual makeover. That's not what Paul's saying. That's not what has happened to us. We're not some kind of rehab project. We have been made by God's grace in virtue of our union with Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, something new altogether. We are a new creative work, is what is being described. So these people that teach that somehow that we are a combination of both the old man and the do man do great damage and a disservice to the church. Because this is not what Scripture teaches. This is not what Paul is saying here. Again, this statement was crucified with him. Notice that here in the English, this is translated here in the past tense. 
because that is conveying again. This is found also in the aorist tense here in the Greek, which I've explained before is important because it is conveying the idea that something has already happened in the past. It's a, it's a snapshot into time, into the past. It's already happened. When you were regenerated to newness of life, you were also united to Christ by the Holy Spirit, and the result being that your old, unregenerate self, that man who was by nature a child of wrath, that man in Adam was crucified. He died. And this is not the only place that Paul uses this kind of language in Scripture to convey this very same truth. Consider Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. He says there, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. There you see it. You laid aside the old self. And have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This is the exact same language. The old self, the old man. He's been laid aside. He's out of the way. He's out of the picture. It is accomplished already. You have put on the new man. It's already accomplished. And they're not the same. They're mutually exclusive. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. There we see... Paul says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. They have crucified it. They put it away. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 20. Here again, Paul is saying the same thing. Beginning in verse 20, he says, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life. What's that talking about, this former manner of life? This is the old self. This is the old man. He goes on to say, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So here's where some people get confused. Because when they read this, It makes them sound like that they're being commanded to do something yet. To to put off the old and put on the new. Now this doesn't seem to jive what we've been reading elsewhere though, right? We know that. Because in these other ones, it seems to be completely done. It's completely over with. So then the question that we have to ask is, well, how do we view this passage in light of the others that convey that the old man's already dead and the new man is all that there is now? Well, let's remind ourselves again who the old man or the old self is describing in these passages. It's clear from these other contexts. It's you when you were in Adam. It's this man that was born into sin, the man born under condemnation, the man who the wrath of God abides on. This is the unregenerate man. And I'll let Martin Lloyd-Jones take it from here regarding Ephesians 4 in light of our passage. He says, if you realize that that is what the term old man means, you will then understand when Paul says, put off the old man. He means that we must put off the characteristics of the life of the old man. It cannot mean anything else. I cannot be told to put off something that has already been crucified. The difficulty is really one of terms. What the apostle is saying, in effect, is, 
Do not go on living as if you still were that old man, because that man has died. Do not go on living as if he was still there. Put that off. That is the meaning of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And again, this goes back to what I talked about last week. This is what Paul keeps doing and will go on to do in chapter 6 of our study. Act like you are. If you are a new man in Christ Jesus, then act like you're a new man in Christ Jesus. Live out the reality that you are in Him. This is the exhortation that goes forth, and this forces you then to ask yourself the question. As you read these, as you go through this, as you meditate on it, am I living in accordance with the new man? Is that me? Again, now that we've again established this fact and reality, we've still not dealt with the question on what is really, it really means to die to sin. Nor have we dealt with the issue of this detail that sin still dwells in us. Well, I believe the second part of verse 6 will begin to clarify some of this. And again, there is key language here that we cannot ignore. Notice the words there, in order that. What does that tell us? Remember what Paul wants us to know something here. He wants us to know the purpose of our old self being crucified with Christ in order that, or for this end. And there are two purposes given here that helps us understand what it means practically that our old self has been crucified. The first one that we see there is that our body of sin might be done away with. Secondly, we see that we will no longer be slaves to sin. Now again, we need to be very precise with the language in this passage. Here we need to be careful with this new language that really for the first time within this letter, Paul is now introducing it here. Our body of sin. And now we need to define what this means. Our body of sin. And this really becomes the, the greater difficulty here. And I think, for, I think it's helpful for us to start with what it doesn't mean. Some take the phrase, body of sin, and they want to view that statement as a mass of sin. And I'll kind of explain what that means. But this is a view that John Calvin made popular. And obviously, if John Calvin believed it, there's a lot of people then who were wanting to agree with this statement. So he talks about this mass of sin, and when you're talking about the word mass, he's talking about it like we would talk about a, the way we use the language, a body of water. And when we use that term, we're talking about a significant accumulation of water in one area. This is a body of water. And they view this statement as the same, this body of sin, this mass of sin, this accumulation of sin. And we died to sin so that this mass of sin in us can be done away with. And of course, I completely idea that that is true in a sense and consistent with Scripture. But I'll make the argument that's not what Paul's talking about here, and I'll explain. There are others who think that Paul's merely repeating himself here when he uses this term, body of sin. And he says that, basically, they think that he's just restating the idea of the old man who's been crucified with Christ. And so to them, the old man and the body of sin here are kind of synonymous statements. But I argue that that wouldn't make any sense. You don't use the conjunctive phrase in order that just to repeat yourself. Because essentially that's what would be happening. So what does Paul mean by this body of sin? Well, I think he means by it what he means when he says what he says in verse 12. Look there at verse 12 of this chapter here. When he refers to the mortal body. 
So I actually think here, as he starts to use this word within context, it's referring to his physical body. But as we're going to have to explain and why we got to be so precise, not just his physical body in and of itself, and I will explain that as well too, but I want you to understand where Paul goes on to from here in reference to the physical body because it begins to become a common subject matter. Because Paul says that the purpose of us dying to sin is so that this body of sin of ours might be done away with. Or some translations say there, might read, brought to nothing. So we're talking about the physical body. Let's first talk, now let's talk about this idea of it being done away with, and then we'll explain further. That verb there might be done away with, cardargeo, carries with it the sense of being inactivated. It's kind of the idea of something being idle or something to be rendered uh, ineffective or inoperative. Uh, a lot of the ways that we understand this word is because Paul uses this word elsewhere a lot within Romans. And it's conveying ideas such as that. So some might translate this to be, it can no longer exert any controlling force or power. Now, if, if you're sitting there with an old King James version and you see it translated destroyed there, that is not a good translation. And actually, a lot of people have ran away from that completely as a translation because that's how these people who who teach that you become perfect, this, they call it perfectionism, once you are saved, they use this verse to justify that, and they use the translation there, destroyed, to somehow defend their statement there. So here's where we need to be very precise. When understanding how Paul uses this idea of the body, and this, this body of sin being done away with here, as we're talking about, or rendered inoperative or ineffective. I'm also going to make sure to, to, to let you know that as he goes on to talk about it, he also uses the word flesh synonymously. So he'll use body, and then he'll use flesh as he moves through. And there's some things that we do know and we have to state. We know that we can't by default say that the physical body is in and of itself sinful. And we can't say the same thing when he uses the word flesh. That'll get you in trouble real quick. If you start saying that the physical, the body in and of itself is sinful. That's what the Greeks would really do. They would say that anything that is, that is physical or material, it is bad. Anything that is spiritual, those things are good. So we never can say, and I'm not saying, that the physical body is intrinsically evil. For instance, we know that we can't say that or we'd have a lot of problems with Jesus, wouldn't we? Jesus had a real physical body just like you and me. He was tempted in all points that we were tempted he would, but he was perfectly sinless. So we can't say just by default that this idea of the physical body or the flesh, that word sarks, when it's used in Scripture, is talking about anything that is intrinsically sinful or evil. We know that flesh sometimes is used in ways where you cannot say that it means that it's talking about it being sinful. Consider John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became what? Flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know then that when we're talking about just the physical body, or even talking about this word flesh, just as it stands by itself, it cannot mean that it's inherently evil or tainted with sin. However, it is the words that Paul has chosen to use to describe this sin that dwells in us. This is the language he uses. This body, this flesh. 
Now, I'm not going to go through an exhaustive look at how Paul uses the word body or the word flesh over the next couple of chapters. We will sort that out as we get to it. But I do want to show you a prime example in chapter 8, if you want to turn there with me. Because in chapter 8, beginning in verse 10, we see, again, this language being used. And here, as we go through here, you're going to see how the word body and the word flesh are used interchangeably. And we can see that they're used in a negative way to describe this indwelling sin that is in our bodies. Look there at verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So here we can see that, for one thing, that this body that Paul is referring to here is also described as our mortal bodies. This is talking about our physical bodies. These members is language that he uses. These members that take place. And it is the same as the flesh. Living according to the flesh. And that by living by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. After he talks about the flesh. So we know when we see how he's using this language. And then it really comes into focus for me at the end of chapter 8 and verse 23. As he continues his argument through, and then he says, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our what? Our body. There's a problem with our body. This is what he's getting at as we move again here. And obviously, again, he's talking here about our physical bodies, what we're, this redemption that we are waiting for, for it to be complete. But our bodies is just not our physical bodies in and of themselves. This is where you got to be precise. It includes the mind as well. That is where sin starts. But we also know that we can't separate the mind from the body, can we? Our mind operates in a fleshly brain. They're so, communi- they're so uh, tied together, entwined, there's no separating them. God only separates that when you die. And your soul goes to heaven. He'll, he'll separate that then. But now it, it can't be separated. There's no procedure that you can go through to, to separate it. It's all intertwined with one another. It's the whole person. But the body is the means, Paul's telling us here, in which sin is accomplished. So we're talking about the whole person. So what am I getting at? Well, since we need to be precise here, the body of sin or the idea of the flesh, it needs to be further defined. So how do we define it then? How do we look at this language that we're going to see throughout here in verse 6 and the next couple of chapters? It is the sin that remains and dwells in us Obviously, that Paul is talking about here in chapter 7. It is the part of us, whatever part that is, that is waiting for the redemption of our body. This complete and total redemption of everything about us that has been touched by fallenness and still remains. 
Some theologians call it unredeemed humanness because they don't know any other way to explain it. It is these, it is these members that he's talking about. And these members are these sinful propensities that are intertwined with physical weakness or pleasures. That is the body of sin that we're talking about. It's not the old man. That man's dead. There is a new man. But that new man lives in a body that is still touched and marred by sin. There is a weakness in that body. There are sinful propensities. There are instincts. There are sinful bents still alive and they're still present in this unredeemed body of ours. Yes, we are a new creature. We are now spiritual when previously we were fleshly. Our old regenerate self is dead. There is a radical change that's taken place in the heart of the new man. There is, it's a recreated miracle inside of us. Our relationship to sin has been altered and changed forever because of it. But we have to admit, and we know here, and what Paul is describing, we are not remade a perfect creature, are we? We still have to deal with the fallout of Adam's consequences. Our body, everything that hasn't been redeemed in us, that happens during regeneration, still resides under the curse. Not the curse of the law to condemn us, but we still have to live in a sin-cursed world. We still have our same bodies that we had prior to our conversion. And we still have these same sinful propensities, instincts, and sinful bents that really I want to just say they're, they're vestiges of Adam that remain in our mortal bodies or they're vestiges of the consequences of Adam's fall that remain in our mortal bodies. So that is how you have to describe and think about this. Yes, we were dead to sin. We are something altogether new. But yet, at the same time, we still have these vestiges of sin in us. John MacArthur describes the believer as this, and I think this is a great description. He says, he is a new, redeemed, holy creation, incarcerated in unredeemed flesh. We're stuck there. We're, we're new, but we're, we're trapped inside of these bodies that create problems for us. We're enslaved to that in a sense. But you've got to be careful with that language. This is where it gets tricky. It's kind of hard to explain. We have been redeemed, this is true, but not all of us is redeemed. Only part of us is redeemed. Our bodies are not redeemed. We have been made new, we have not made been we have not been made new altogether yet, because we're redeemed in steps. That's what's described. We're, we're partially redeemed. Our, our soul, we're, we're a spirit. Our personality is redeemed, but this body is not. That doesn't happen until the sound of the last trumpet. Then all will be new, including our body that still groans for that day. Completely then and forever changed. But until the new man on this earth, until then... He must still live in a body that has this propensity to sin. And this is what we experience. This is the struggle that gives us the angst that we know takes place inside of us. We feel our weakness. We know it to be there. Let me give you an example of this. And this is kind of an example that kind of makes light of it, but but not really, it actually just shows just how actual weak our bodies are and how sinful they are. And many of you can understand this. So let's say it's Friday night and I want to go out for pizza. I love to go out for pizza. And actually, I'm starving to death, to use the language. I'm, I'm, 
I'm hungry out of my mind. I've been busy all day. I have been exerting myself. I haven't eaten a whole lot during the day. I burn a lot of calories, and my body wants to restore calories. I need it. So we go there, we order pizza, we sit down, my senses start rolling, I smell the pizza, I'm hungry, my mouth's watering. They bring that pizza out, I start eating it, and man, it is good. It is really good, and I keep eating it, and I want to keep eating more of it because I'm really hungry. And the next thing you know, I have completely overeaten, and eaten so much that I feel like I can't even move. But I was so delighted in the food. I was so delighted. But up to that point, I had done, there was nothing sinful about any of the facts that I just communicated to you. There's nothing sinful in being hungry. That's a natural instinct. That's something natural in the body. Wanting to eat a meal, that's a natural desire. All of these things up to that point are good, but there's a weakness that's created in me because I'm really hungry. I'm at lack, lack some self-control. So then I overeat and I enter into what Scripture would describe as a gluttonous act. There was no moderation at all over what I've done. And I start really noticing about 20 minutes later when I finally confess that I have sinned and I hate myself because I overate. But this is how our body works. This is how these, these weaknesses, these natural bents will play upon us and still exist inside of us. They create temptations. It makes it easy for us to sin. I didn't even get to my weakness of how I really feel when I'm hungry. The irritability is unbelievable. And there are millions of examples that you can come up with like this. This is just one common way that the vestige of our fallen humanness creates a propensity for us to sin. You can say the same thing about sexual hormones in the body. God has a righteous and godly purpose for those hormones. It leads to us pursuing spouse, marriage, it leads to procreation, but it can also be used in the same time sinfully to express some of the most heinous sinful acts. This is what's being described here. So let's just take a step back and remind ourselves of what's going on here. The reason that God has united us in union with Christ is so that the old man is crucified with Christ. One of the purposes of this is so that these inclinations or these propensities to sin, these natural instincts that operate so strongly in our bodies might no longer exercise effective power or control over us. That's what he's saying there in that passage. They might still be there, but guess what they don't do? They don't dominate us. They've been robbed of their power. They've been redeemed inoperative. They've lost their influence. It, you could say that it's been dethroned inside of them. Which sets up really the second purpose of us dying to sin, that he goes on to say there in verse 6, is that we're no longer slaves of sin. That's what it does for us. It means we're no longer under the tyranny of sin. We're no longer controlled by it. It is no longer master over us. We serve someone different. Our relationship with sin has changed forever. It no longer dominates our lives. That's why Paul uses, it says, how can we who've died to sin still live in it? That language in scripture, live in it, is communicating the idea that you're being dominated by it. It's the same idea that you see elsewhere about walking in sin. That is language to communicate that you're being dominated by sin. It is controlling you. You're serving it. But we have to deal with that and understand that it's sin still around, though. 
Sin still dwells in us. But what we should see and know is that it no longer reigns as a power that we can't defeat. It's no longer sovereign over us. This is Paul's point. Augustine, the early church father, he'd use Latin phrases to describe the four states of men. And I think this is kind of helpful as we think through the reality of of what Paul is communicating through here. He talks about Adam in the garden before the fall. And he uses the Latin phrase, passe pecare, which means able to sin. So we know he hadn't sinned yet, but he had the ability to sin. He would use that language. But then he described Adam after the fall. In which what he's really describing Adam after the fall, he's describing everyone in Adam. All of us before our conversion. And he says in there, he uses the Latin phrase, non posse, non pecare. Not able not to sin. What's that communicating? Like you're being dominated by sin. Sin is controlling you. That's all you can do. That's your default response. You are a slave to it. This is the condition in which man operates. Not able not to sin. And then there's the believer. He describes them as passe non pecare. They're able not to sin. Why are they able not to sin? Because it no longer has power over them. They're no longer slaves to sin. That, that body of sin has been rendered ineffective, inoperative. They have the ability to control it, to have self-control, to be able to control their desires, to be able to control these things. And then there is what Augustine describes us in the glorified state. Non posse pecare. Not able to sin. Where there we will neither be tempted nor will be able to fall again. We will be completely, at that point, a total new creature. All parts of us, including our physical body. But until that point, we are all passe non pecare. We are able not to sin. And our present inclination to sin has been robbed of its previous power, and we are no longer under the bondage of sin. This is what it means to have died to sin. This is how we must understand this idea as it plays out. We are delivered from the tyranny of sin. We no longer live in that sphere or that state. We've been But we have not been completely delivered from all of its influence. That is a battle that we must fight until he takes us home. But we must not get discouraged. For we understand that the battle against sin that dwells in us is a long, arduous battle. We know firsthand that it is taxing and that it is laborsome. But this is our help. We are told that the old man is dead. Victory is ours to be had in this battle. Dear brethren, we are told here that we are not fighting a battle that we can't win. Actually, Paul's point here to the believer is that our victory over sin is sure. As he tells us there in verse 7, that we're free from sin. So let's go on and act like free men who are not enslaved to sin. Let's pray. Father, certainly your word is clear as a whole. Father, that you've made us new creatures, you've delivered us from the power and tyranny of sin. And Father, I ask now that we might live out that reality in all of its fullness. That we might constantly seek to put to death sin that still dwells in us. 
But Father, I pray that it would never reign in us. And that we would be people who would be able to live holy and righteous lives and live lives that are worthy and walk in accordance with your Son, Jesus, who died for us, who rose from the dead, so that we might have everlasting life, that we might be redeemed through and through on that day. And I pray that we would long for that, that we would look forward to that, that that would be our hope, that one day, that deliverance from sin, that we no longer battle, that we no longer have to fight, and there where we rest in the glory of your Son, Jesus. And I pray that now we might find as much rest as we can in him on this Lord's day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.